Good evening. I'm Graham Allison, director of the Belfer Center here at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and it's my great honor and privilege to welcome tonight to the Kennedy Forum uh, Brent Scowcroft. Uh, Brent was the national security advisor for Bush 41, George Herbert Walker Bush, and Jerry Ford. He's, uh, prior to that, a distinguished Air Force officer, uh, rising to the rank of general, a pilot. He's been held positions at the JCS, at the headquarters of the Air Force, and in the office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. He was a graduate of West Point, and he has a PhD from Columbia. Uh, so a remarkable human being in so many different dimensions. I uh, uh, said earlier today in a conversation with another group that if you uh, had a serious national security problem and you could only consult one person about the difficult problem, could only consult one person who you, whose advice you would listen to and take about what to do, that person, in my view, of all the people that I've seen in the American national security uh, establishment is Brent Scowcroft. Uh, Brent's uh, so much to say about him. Uh, I would say uh, he's the answer to uh, many, many questions, and I'm going to give you four questions to which he's the answer, okay? Uh, or just four. So in, uh, in a course that I uh, teach sometimes, students frequently ask, uh, we read a, read a book about the wise men who were the folks like Marshall and Atchison and Vandenberg who put together the structures that won the Cold War and pro provided 60 years of peace and prosperity. Wh whatever happened to wise men in this generation? And I would say uh, one answer that I frequently give is look to Brent Scowcroft. Second question, why is Brent famous? and respect it uh, beyond the positions that he held, uh, and wh why is he respected for things that he did? Well, the, the list is a long list, but if you uh, go back to the period in which uh, he was the national security advisor to Bush 41, and in President Bush's words, which he mentioned even when he was here in the forum once, the two were essentially joined at the hip. When President Bush came to write his memoirs, he says in the book, he decided he couldn't write them by, them, by himself, and so it's written jointly with Scowcroft because, as President Bush says, he couldn't tell where his ideas left off and Scowcroft's began or, or, or vice versa. Well, in that period, they managed successfully to surf the wave that had built up over uh, two generations that brought the end of the Cold War with a whimper rather than a bang, that saw the liberation of Eastern and Central Europe, that survived the collapse of the Soviet Union and ultimately the collection of all the nuclear weapons and materials that were left outside that saw Germany unified and managed to weave a rather narrow straits in the, the diplomacy that led to unification of Germany inside NATO. So if I make the list of great achievements of the period during the Cold War, you can find uh, in a mild fashion uh, and often without uh, a lot of shouting, but important fingerprints of Brent Scowcroft doing things, not just being something. Third, third question uh, that relates very much to students here in the school. Uh, there's been a debate, uh, Brent, that you'd be amused by, uh, about the question of whether a person who enters uh, career government service can rise to the top of our government, or whether the better path is to be a so-called in and outer, so doing things inside, outside. Well. Brent Scowcroft went to West Point, was a career Air Force officer, 
and rose to be the alter ego of the president as, deputy, as, as national security advisor. Is this a unique case? It's worth to think about. I would say our greatest post-war Secretary of State, George Marshall, was a military officer. So is it only military career services that leads to such, uh, 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 distinct, to such opportunities to contribute? Our greatest strategic analyst in the period since the Cold War was, of, began his career and lived through his career as a foreign service officer, George Kennan. And in case you didn't notice, in the intelligence realm, there's a fellow who started, when he left graduate school, as an analyst at CIA, who is our current Secretary of Defense. So is it possible in a career government service to rise to the top of the system? The answer is indeed. F finally, uh, there's a, another local debate about whether or why American foreign policy establishmentarians seem so reserved or reluctant to speak truth to power when power is of their own party's persuasion, maybe even their friends, maybe even the son of one of one's best friends. Okay? Well, interestingly enough, uh, again, Brent Skokoff is the answer to that question. And if you'll ask who among the American foreign policy establishment has spoken out most clearly, most steadily, most courageously when he disagreed with the current administration and the administration before that and the administration before that, I would say it's Brent Skokoff. And if you want a great article to read, go back to the Wall Street Journal of 15 August 2002, an op-ed that's entitled, Don't Attack Saddam. So for all of this, we're very grateful for Brent. What he's gonna talk about tonight is a new book that Brent Scowcroft and Spig Brzezinski have published, or have, have produced, called America and the World, Conversations on the Future of American Foreign Policy. So here one has one long-term, lifetime, deeply committed Republican, Brent Scowcroft, and one lifetime Democrat, Spig Brzezinski, both having served as national security advisors, talking about where America is today and where it can go in the future. And what's remarkable about this book, which I recommend with enthusiasm, is the extent to which uh, uh, in the conversations, in very candid conversations, David Ignatius, the editor, manages to get people to figure out at an important level of depth where they agree and where they disagree. And I would say the big takeaway from this is that these two people, one very committed Republican, one very committed Democrat, on all the most important issues fundamentally agree about 80% of the time. And if that's the foundation for our foreign policy going forward, a week from now when we have a new president, whether it's Obama or McCain, I would say the country would be very well served. So thank you very much for Prince Gokrat. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, I'm better off not saying a word. I can't improve on that. It can only go downhill from here. And the famous, uh, the famous saying is that uh, my father would have enjoyed that introduction. My mother might have believed it. But uh, uh, when, uh, when Graham was saying what I'm famous for, I thought he was going to mention the award that President Bush Sr. established in my name. It was called the Scowcroft Award. And it was the person who most frequently fell asleep in official meetings and woke up pretending nothing had ever happened. <laughs> uh, I was a clear winner. Uh, 
it's wonderful to be here with you tonight uh, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, about the world we're facing and based on on the book that Zbig Brzezinski and I wrote. And the reason we the reason we did this uh, was that we we both became alarmed at the quality of discourse, especially on foreign policy, which is what we're both involved in. The quality of discourse in this country, given the problems we face. And what we tried to say is that what we really need is an American approach. Uh, and what we tried to show is that a lifelong Democrat, a lifelong Republican can sit down and civilly discuss the issues, agree on most of them, disagree on some, but the disagreement is in such a way that it illuminates the issue and deepens the understanding of the different perspectives on issue, and that's what we desperately need in this country. Uh, in less than a week, we will have a new president, a president elect. And he will be inheriting a very troubled world. Uh, almost everywhere you look, there are problems. And most of them are gradually getting worse. A few of them not. Uh, this president, whichever one we have, needs to have the best thinking he can get around him. And we need to stop simply shouting at each other and playing one-upsmanship and gotcha and look at how we deal with the problems we face because they're not, they're not easy problems. We don't face an apocalyptic threat like we did in the Cold War where if we made a serious mistake we could blow up the world. But there are all kinds of problems. There are problems that come from areas of the world we hardly understand at all. And the world itself is changing. So we're, we're hoping that this will be a small effort that will encourage the development of discourse in this country about the problems that we face rather than simply playing one-upsmanship. So one of the things we did, what, what are the problems the next president will face? What, what do we need to do? And that's what I'll, t I'll talk about, just a few of them uh, tonight. And uh, uh, I'm glad I don't have to write that first memo for the president because it will be discouraging, really discouraging, because we have such a list of problems. Uh, and putting them in priority order is extremely hard. And you have important problems, you have urgent problems, you have important urgent problems. And how you decide on them is difficult. And mind you, no administration can really devote top-level attention constantly to more than a, a, a mere handful of issues. So it's important how you, how you decide. But uh, let me talk about the, the, the quality, the different kinds of issues, important and urgent. There are two important issues that are not urgent and indeed could easily go unnoticed but I think they're key. And the first one is fundamentally important, and that is the image of the United States in the world is not good now. In fact, in the years I've been traveling around the world, I think it has never been less, and the polling that people like the Pew Institute do periodically demonstrates that. And that is not only uncomfortable for us, but it hurts badly because 
The world is in serious need of leadership. And I mean real leadership. The convening power, the ability to get nations around common purposes and move together. We have had that in the past uh, because by and large, most of the world thinks we mean well. Even if, even if they don't agree with all of our policies, we're trying to do the right thing. And so we've always had the benefit of the doubt. We don't have that anymore. And that makes it very hard. People don't say, yes, the United States wants this, we'll follow them. Not at all. That, and unless we can restore that, the world will be worse off. Because we're the only ones with that capability in the world now. Certainly the Chinese can't do it. The Russians can't. The Indians can't. At, at one, some point, maybe the Europeans will be able to play that role. But right now, they're not able to. So if we can't do it, it won't be done. And the world today of the 21st century badly needs that kind of ability. Because in this globalized world, the nation state can't provide for its citizens the way it used to. Too many, or no, I shouldn't say too many, many of the problems we all face are not respecters of national boundaries. Indeed, in many respects, national boundaries are now eroding. And to deal with problems, one of the most obvious, of course, is climate change. One has to reach out, get together everyone to try to arrive at a problem which is, which is truly global. The other problem that a president may want to face and may not is the structure of government, especially in, in foreign affairs. Uh, the National Security Council was set up in 1947 to deal with the problems that were perceived as a result of World War II and the lack of coordination. It has gone through a number of changes, uh, but we now face a world which is very different from the world that the National Security Council has done so well in uh, helping the president with. And many of the conflicts that we will face, we're facing now and in the future, will not be great wars against other great powers, but they will be dealing with civil wars in various places, or wars with non-state actors, the kind of messy things, not the grand glories of fighter planes in the air and tanks marching across borders, uh, uniforms, flags, but messy kinds of things, partly fighting, partly nation building. And we're not organized to do that sort of thing. There isn't anybody who focuses anymore on nation building as a government, no organization. We have the military to fight wars, and we use the military a lot to do nation building. They're not designed for it. That's one of the problems. In addition, the National Security Council, for most of its existence, managed most foreign policy issues. Now we have a National Economic Council as well, and we have a Homeland Security Council. So now there are three of them. Uh, the National Security Council is approximately three times as large as it was when I was last there 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it is growing perhaps beyond the ability for it to act the way it used to. Anyway, a new president may want to look at that. Then there's the world that is moving every day, will move a lot farther before the president-elect takes office, and he has to deal with that. 
one of the first things he's going to have to deal with even before he enters office is the financial crisis we face. I'm not an economist and I'm not going to get into the depths of that. But it's made several things clear. First is that economically we have one world. Clearly, there is a world economy. And what happens in one place, because of our interconnectedness now, spreads immediately to the rest of the world. That is a very new development. Politically, the world is still atomized. There are 192 members of the United Nations. But economically, it is, it is one world. When this crisis broke, it broke first in the United States, and we reacted as if we were the only country in the world. And we focused only on dealing with our own problems. Then it spread to Europe. And even the EU, did they react as the EU? No. They reacted as national governments themselves. Now we're beginning to realize that we have to work together. One of the problems with working together is that the economic institutions that we have to deal with international economic problems, the Bretton Woods set of agreements were established in 1944 for a world which has long since disappeared. Now, President Bush has asked for a meeting of the G20, which will take place in a couple of weeks, I think, to look at how we can deal with this world economic problem in a world way. He will not be around to implement any of the things that are decided on. But he's the president, and he's the president till the 20th of January. The president-elect will have to deal with these problems, but he has nothing to say about them before. So this, this November conference will be very interesting, and the first time that, uh, uh, that the president-elect comes right up against uh, very practical issues. But looking out at the world in, the, in terms of the foreign policy issues the president has to deal with, uh, I guess I would say what I would call the arc of crisis is where the president's attention will have to be focused. And that's the area starting with the Balkans down through the Middle East into into uh, Central Asia and ending up with, uh, with North Korea. And in that area, uh, I think the Middle East is at the heart of the issues. Now, it's interesting. A year ago, national attention was dominated by Iraq. Now Iraq is about the fifth problem in U.S. consciousness that shows how fast things have changed. But the problems of the Middle East, the many different problems, have as a result of our involvement in Iraq and its general consequences, they've all become overlapping and interconnected. And one can't look at them as completely hermetically sealed problems, even though we still talk about many of them uh, that way. Uh, Iraq's a, a useful place to start because uh, it has been such a difficult issue for the American people. And the two candidates have somewhat different uh, approaches to Iraq now and what we do. The situation in Iraq is improving. It's improving in part because of the surge and the change of tactics brought about by the surge, but it's also changing because rather than attacking everybody who was creating a problem for us, we have reached out to those who had different motives from Al-Qaeda, for example, and tried to deal with them. 
And the consequence is that a lot of the hostility in the country is now, has now been reduced. I think that the prospects are that we can gradually reduce our forces as the Iraqi army uh, continues to develop and be able to take over the security situation. But the Iraqi army can do the actual fighting quite well now, and it's improving every day. But it needs support from the United States for everything else, uh, for artillery support, for helicopter support, for intelligence, for supplies, for infrastructure. Uh, the Army is just literally just fighting men here. It has no backup. So that will take some time. Uh, While the military situation is improving, the political situation is really not. But we can't solve the political problems. So what do we do? What, what, is, what is our goal? What does success mean in Iraq? Uh, I think we need to define it by an Iraq which is an influence for stability in the region rather than for chaos and conflict. Now, how do you know when that is? Well, it's imperfect. It's sort of like, how do you know when to take the training wheels off your kid's bicycle? Uh, you, sort of, you sort of know. Uh, and to me, I think that's the issue between the two candidates now. Uh, and one of them is still sort of on a democracy kick. The other says, no, the we ought to get out by, by the calendar. Well, I think that is not a way to make a decision like this, because the progress in Iraq is fragile and easily reversed. And it would be a shame after going so far that we turn around and let it collapse, because a collapse in, in Iraq would not just be a collapse in Iraq. It could lead to the Middle East as a whole looking like Iraq looks now. And that's not a good one. But while this is going on, the improvement in Iraq, what can we do for the region? Because the US role in the region has changed dramatically, too. Uh, none of the nations in the region supported our going into Iraq. And whereas in the first Gulf War, we had strong Arab support. We had Arab troops, Egyptian troops, Moroccan troops, Syrian troops with us on the first. They're invisible now. Why? Because of the way we did it against their wishes, but also, uh, because we have not paid attention to the gnawing problem and the sense of injustice in the whole region, and that's a Palestinian issue. I think while we're working on Iraq, that uh, uh, the next president needs strongly to pick up the Palestinian issue and to make it a number one priority. Uh, it won't be easy, but there's nothing, I don't think, that would change the psychological climate of the region more than that. It would put Iran back on the defensive. It would take some of the steam out of Hezbollah and Hamas, whose raison d'etre, really, was built on the injustice of the Palestinian situation. Uh, and it would help get Arab support for dealing with the issue of Iraq. Then there's Iran. And there are two problems with Iran. The first one is Iran in the region. And the second, Iran with nuclear weapons. Iran in the region is clearly a problem for us. 
And Iran clearly enjoys making difficulty for us in Iraq, partly because then we don't have a time to focus on Iran. But we need to find out what kind of an Iraq Iran would like to see. And is there any common ground between us? Iran fought an eight-year war with Iraq in the 1980s. Uh, so it clearly doesn't want an Iraq which would be a threat. Does it want an Iraq which is broken up into its constituent parts? That would certainly not make Iraq a power that could attack Iran. And the southern part of Iraq might become a very, have a very cozy relationship with Iran. So that could have some attractive features. But up in the north, an Iraq where Kurdistan breaks off and becomes an independent state would create huge problems for Iran as well as for Turkey because there's a very large Kurdish minority in Iran like there is in Turkey. Uh, so what, we don't know. We don't know. I don't think we can uh, certainly uh, have, make common cause with Iran there. But there may be some openings there that would help us in Iraq. But there's only one way to find out. And we haven't done that yet. Iraq with nuclear weapons. To me, the biggest problem with Iraq with nuclear weapons is not that they might have a few bombs themselves, but the impact on proliferation around the world. Because I think it is virtually certain that if Iraq, Iran is allowed to enrich uranium to weapons quality, that uh, Egypt will follow, and Saudi Arabia will follow, and Turkey will follow, and then you will have countries around the world feeling they have to prepare for a different kind of world, and you may have 30 or 40 countries a month or two away from a nuclear weapon. That's not a better world. Uh, can we prevent it? I don't know. But I don't think we have, I don't think it's re we're ready to make a conclusion that we can't prevent it. Because there are certainly possibilities. And I think those possibilities are, first of all, that we need to talk to Iran. And those discussions can't start by saying, Iran, you have to give up most of your leverage before we'll talk to you. But if we, if we can talk to them, then how can we persuade them? It seems to me to persuade them that they don't need to go this route is to discuss the region with them and say, frankly, we know you live in a difficult region. You're a Shia country in a Sunni region. You are a Persian culture in an Arab region. So naturally, you have problems. We're prepared to sit down with you and talk about a security framework for the region in which you can feel secure. And for the other countries involved in Iran, and that is the Europeans, the British, the French, the Germans, and the Russians and the Chinese. We need to be able to present an absolute united front to the Iranians against their moving ahead. And I think if that can happen, there's a chance that they will maybe not re renounce their right to have nuclear weapons, but be prepared to pause. Now, none of the countries that I've mentioned 
want Iran to have nuclear weapons. But there's not that kind of unanimity which we need in order to convince Iran that the civilized world doesn't want them to go this route. Uh, the two difficult ones are China and Russia. And I think of the, of the two that uh, Russia is the bigger issue. Russia has been reasonably cooperative uh, on Iran. They're refueling the Bushehr nuclear power plant, but they're doing it with least fuel. The Russians will retain ownership and they'll take the fuel back after it has been burned. So they're, they're doing fine, but uh, the cooperation of the Russians is marred by the handling of the Russians by us and by the Europeans. And the most complicated part of it is what happened in, uh, in, in Georgia. And from the Russian perspective, from the Russian perspective, uh, Georgia is another step in what the Russians see is the West's attempt to continue to humiliate them and not take them seriously. Uh, as we have proceeded in the Kosovo operation, every step of the way from our first use of force against uh, Milosevic in Yugoslavia, in 98, uh, the Russians said, don't do that, it's not the way to go. When we occupied Kosovo, uh, and then said Kosovo should be independent, they said, no, don't do that, it's just like South Ossetia. And we said, no, it's not like South Ossetia at all. Uh, Kosovo is unique, so we went ahead. Well, they have now demonstrated that it's like South Ossetia by occupying South Ossetia. Uh, and the Russians are right now not disposed particularly to cooperate with us on Iran. Go farther east, just a moment on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, very difficult problems. And I think we need a new look at Afghanistan and a realization that Afghanistan is not Iraq and a strategy which is now working in Iraq will not necessarily work in Afghanistan. Uh, we, after all, have or had 150,000 troops in Iraq a much smaller country than Afghanistan. The Russians had 200,000 troops in Afghanistan and a government which was supportive, uh, like this one is of us, and they failed badly. Uh, the forces we face in Afghanistan are a mixture of Taliban, Al-Qaeda, warlords, and so on. Our first operation in Afghanistan when we moved in, we only had 300, about 300 troops in which we cleaned out the Taliban. How did we do it? We provided intelligence, we provided uh, predator missiles, helicopters to attack but we used tribal troops from the north. There are none now. The Afghan army is very weak, very small, but I think we need to look at the possibilities that the Afghan, the Afghanistan we need may not, that we would like to see, may not have to be a highly centralized modern state like we hope Iraq will be, 
It's never been that way. Afghanistan has always been a tribal society with a loose central government at the top, frequently headed by a king, for example. But it has not been a tightly controlled government, and it hasn't had to be because Iraq is not surrounded by avaricious neighbors. I think we need to take a, a new look at Afghanistan, and the president needs to take that look and say, are we on the right track, or do we need some modification? And I think some of the comments of, uh, uh, of our chairman of the Joint Chiefs after some visits out there indicate that perhaps the administration is thinking along those lines. Pakistan is an extremely difficult problem for us. Pakistan has for it, its 60-odd uh, years of independence had trouble with democracy. They started out with a civilian democratic government. Uh, it didn't work. Military took over, sort of straightened things out, turned it back to the civilians. It didn't work. The military took it over. That's happened four times now. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation. Now, the military, Musharraf is gone, and the two main political parties, these are political parties, they're not political parties like Republicans and Democrats. They're sort of, uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't know what the word is. Uh, they're na groupings. Follow, following leaders, they're not political parties in other, any normal sense of the word. As you see, when Benazir Bhutto was assassinated, uh, they didn't have a new election. Her son became the titular head of the party. So it, it, it's that sort of thing. But both the current president, Zadari, and the head of the main opposition party, Sharif, have been prime ministers before and both been booted out by the military. Uh, it's a very, very complicated and difficult situation. And all I can do is wish the new president luck in dealing with Pakistan. Uh, the last thing I will mention just briefly is, is North Korea. And there, I think we've made a lot of progress. And we've made, a, we've made a lot of progress for several reasons. First, we've been more patient than we have in some other areas. Secondly, we have be, behaved in a way which has encouraged others to help us. Our first idea expressed by the president in the axis of evil speech he gave in a uh, in 2002 was countries we don't like, our solution is regime change. And uh, we, we had that uh, policy toward North Korea and toward uh, uh, Iran. Well, the Chinese don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons. But regime change was anathema to them because that meant a North Korea in chaos and the prospect of hundreds of thousands of North Koreans going across the border into China. So we got no support from the Chinese. As our attitude changed, the Chinese attitude changed. And at first, the Chinese said, well, look, North Koreans have gone their way. We've gone our way. Uh, we don't have much to do with them. That's your problem. Then they reluctantly agreed, well, we will convene six-party talks. Uh, we'll provide the room and we'll serve the tea, but y you do the negotiating. But now, I think significantly because we've changed our attitude, they are applying pressure and they're working the problem. As a consequence, while one never knows about North Korea, I think we are on a decent course now. 
we got a long way to go, but I think uh, I think there's some possibilities. So you sit down. That's the first briefing for the new president. How would you like to be the new president? Why don't I stop there? For I think uh, if the new president listened to this briefing, the first question would be, uh, wait a minute, why did I want this job? Yeah. And the second question would be, okay, Scowcroft, <laughs> what am I supposed to do about these things? Uh, and he would be uh, wise to ask such a question. We've come to the point where folks in the audience can ask a question. The procedure here is line up at the two microphones, one on either side, and similarly in the two loges. Uh, the rules of the game are introduce yourself, uh, ask your question briefly, one question per customer, and it ends with a question mark. So we start with this gentleman. Uh, Richard Baum, uh, you didn't mention um, in your remarks the uh, only established democracy in the Middle East, Israel. And I wanted to ask your thoughts on how, um, how um, the U new U.S. president might work with Israel both to resolve the Palestinian problem and also how uh, the potential of Israel taking action against Iran fits into uh, this challenge. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, uh, <clears throat> to take them in reverse order, uh, I think Israel, of course, is very concerned about Iran and the development of nuclear weapons. There was a flurry of activity some time ago well, not a few months ago, when I think the Israeli government was concerned that their current friend in the White House wasn't going to be there very long, and that that's, this was an issue which needed to be solved beforehand. Uh, I believe that has calmed down, and that's a very difficult issue, but it would be not impossible, but very hard for the Israelis to do anything militarily significant without U.S. acquiescence, if not support. And I won't go any, any farther there. Uh, but as I indicated, I don't, think, I don't think we're nearly at the point we ought to be thinking about military activity against Iran. Uh, the consequences of that in the region would be catastrophic, both for Israel and for US interests. Not that Iran is loved at all. The Arabs are very concerned. But the, the psychological consequences that would be, would be very difficult. Now, uh, the issue of Israel We've been trying peace process now for almost 50 years. It, it's this last effort has not succeeded. Uh, but what we, and especially the Israelis, have to realize is that there is a growing sentiment in the Palestinian community that they don't want a two-state solution. And the consequences of that for Israel and for the Palestinians and for us is a pretty daunting prospect. Israel wants to maintain itself as a Jewish state. And, you know, everybody has acquiesced in that. But if there's no two-state solution, then they either have to abandon that or they have to drive the Palestinians out of the territory that's now the West Bank and so on. So, you know, those kinds of things we need, to, we need to face up to. And I think that one of the first acts of the president, as I, as I hinted, needs to be to focus on that issue and to push it for a conclusion. Because so much of the rest of the region hangs on that. Uh, and if we don't do that, 
if we don't do that for the current state of Russian West relations. The Russians could say, hey, we've got a chance now to drive the U.S. right out of the Middle East because they're so disliked. And uh, that's a route we don't want to go. Gentlemen in the first sludge. who made missteps. You know, for example, Secretary Rice um, spent her whole life studying foreign policy and even then making mistakes. So I guess the broader question I want to ask is, what do you think are the ingredients of good foreign policy judgment? How do you reduce the mistakes that you make? And especially if you have advice to students who are studying foreign policy um, who want to serve in those sorts of positions one day, what would you say? Wow. <laughs> uh, well, First of all, learn as much as you can about it. Uh, experience is invaluable. You know, I don't think history teaches, but if you don't learn from it, you're likely to make serious mistakes. But experience is valuable. But experience is only valuable if you have the judgment to know how to apply it and how not to apply it. You know, one of the problems with experience uh, goes to uh, Munich in 38. We've been telling ourselves for a year, no more Munichs, which means we take a belligerent, militaristic attitude toward every crisis that comes up. Uh, you, you need to know what to learn from history and what not to learn from, from history. Uh, this administration, I think, was traumatized by 9-11. Uh, and the character of the administration changed dramatically after 9-11 for a variety of reasons, and I won't go into it. Uh, and they were swept away by a notion that we could solve the problem of this difficult region that I was talking about by moving in, uh, taking out that nasty guy Saddam, creating a democracy there which would spread to the rest of the region, and ergo, the problems would be over. Uh, that uh, The administration has gradually changed that now. It's backing away from that thing. But I think, I think it's the, the power of an idea which swept us for a time. Uh, and and it, it's, a, it's a nice, idealistic idea. But, you know, it gets back to the stuff that you study in international politics, idealism versus realism. The problem with a realist is, says the world is a mess, it's not going to get any better, so let's just not try. The problem with the idealist is, he said, Gee, wouldn't it be great if? So let's just do that without realizing, without understanding the costs of getting there or the costs of trying and failing. And that's the essence of what you need to learn. So what's the balance between those two? Well, I like to call it enlightened realism. <laughs> but there's no, there's no clear answer. But studying it yourself and really analyzing what it is, is is the best recipe I have. Nobody's perfect, and there are no easy answers to the problems I've discussed. I've talked, I've outlined some from these are not easy problems, but they need the best minds we can get together on the problem, not at each other. Thank you. 
Brent, there's an old story about the wise man who uh, uh, is asked, uh, how did he become so wise? And he says, by experience. And the question is, yes, and uh, what kind of experience? Experience in making the right decisions. And how do you get experience in making the right decisions? By making, making the, the wrong, wrong decisions. <laughs> so it's a long yeah. sequence. This gentleman. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a uh, sophomore at the college. Uh, my question for you is, uh, how much of our various problems in Afghanistan and Iraq would you attribute to having, uh, at least at the, at the outset of those conflicts, a military that was still in many ways geared toward fighting a Cold War and fighting Russian tanks in Central Europe and strategic doctrines that were more geared toward that than to fighting insurgents on horseback and mountains in Afghanistan? And uh, Do you think we've moved past that? Or if not, what would you suggest to combat that, uh, that problem? Well, that, you know, that's an excellent question because one of, the, one of the things I mentioned is the nature of warfare is changing. And I think uh, when this administration came in, one of the things they wanted to do was military transformation. But the transformation was in the direction of using modern technology, especially communications, uh, decentralizing command and control, but anyway, fighting a high-tech kind of a war. And the first three weeks in Iraq were exactly that war. But then that phase was over, and we were back to kicking down doors in houses looking for bad guys. Uh, I think that's a major part of the problem that we have not been geared for that. And uh, we're learning. It's taken a long time. One of, the, one of the difficulties was, you know, we learned it once before in uh, Vietnam. But Vietnam was such a distasteful experience for everybody, including the military. They said, never again. So we threw away all the manuals, so on. And it took Petraeus, who wrote a manual on this kind of warfare, to, to bring it back. And uh, Secretary Gates, just a little while ago, gave a speech at the National War College in which he said, we, the military, we have to spend less time, or no, we have to concentrate on learning how to fight the wars we're going to fight, not the wars we would like to fight. In other words, that the period of high-tech war is not the, prom the prominent threat that we face in the future, and I think uh, both Iraq and Afghanistan are, are certainly demonstrating that. Gentleman with right. Uh, good evening, sir. My name's Ian Cornell. I'm a first-year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. Um, as Professor Allison said, you played an integral role in uh, the first Bush administration, the events surrounding the breakup of the former Soviet Union. And having those experiences, I just wonder if you look at our relations with Russia today, are you surprised or do you feel a specific sense of disappointment at the, the low level they are? And where do you think we go from here dealing with, uh, dealing with Russia? I, I think that uh, we, we have not understood Russia very well uh, and not understood what Russia is, I think, going through. Uh, Russia's trying to figure out where it's going. And so far, since the end of the, of the Cold War, there have been three presidents, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and Putin. Now Medvedev, but he's too early. They're, they're very different people. They had very different ideas about governments, about, uh, about the role of Russia. But above and beyond that, we, I think, have pretty much ignored, I think, the sort of sense of national humiliation that a proud people must have felt at the end of the Cold War. Uh, President Bush, senior, 
tried his hardest to say, we didn't win the Cold War, you didn't lose it, everybody won. And we tried hard there. But still, going from one of two superpowers to a political collapse, and then in 98, an economic collapse, that's pretty traumatic. And while that was going on, and this, these are Putin's words, while that was going on, while we were flat on our back, you took advantage of us. You moved, moved NATO up to our borders. You denounced the ABM Treaty unilaterally. You did all these things. And we resent it. And the reason Putin is so popular is he, he's expressing this sense of humiliation. Uh, I think we can do a lot. I, my own sense is Putin's not trying to recreate the Soviet Union. Uh, but he's taking advantage of the situation to make himself very popular and very strong. Uh, but I think if, if we try to tell the Russians, yes, we take you seriously, yes, you do matter, that it would help a lot. Hi, my name is uh, Vibha Kagzi. I'm from the Harvard Business School. I'm from India. And my question to you is regarding Pakistan. So with, when General Musharraf was in power, the US worked with Musharraf and sort of funded him. And there's a belief, at least amongst Indians, that a lot of that money he took home and a lot of that money he used to fuel the terrorism we see in the region. With Musharraf now gone and political instability in Pakistan and the region in general, going forward, what do you think the US should do? Should they continue to align with Pakistan to solve the problem? And how can they destroy the demon that they might have inadvertently created? Well, uh, you know, we, we, did, we didn't create all the problems of Pakistan. But uh, uh, it, it's been complicated. We did support Musharraf. We supported every Pakistan government in a way. Uh, but we also encouraged Musharraf to take his uniform off and do the kinds of things which led to his departure. Uh, we don't understand the situation very well there. Indeed, I'm not sure who does, even inside Pakistan, because it is really very tough. Zadari and Sharif do not like each other. The army has been a probably the soul of Pakistan nationalism. It's been a unifying force in Pakistan. The old leadership in the army, the British trained generals and so on, uh, are pretty well dying out. And the colonels in the Pakistan army were the ones who trained the Taliban to go into Afghanistan against the Soviets. So you've got a delicate situation there. Uh, the most immediate need right now is Pakistan desperately needs a bailout. And I mean, like maybe a week before they have to de declare bankruptcy. Uh, Zadari went to the Chinese and asked for money, and the Chinese said no. Uh, they are now negotiating with the IMF. And uh, the Germans have said they will help and so on. Uh, Pakistan is in desperate economic shape right now. And a lawless Pakistan, 170 million people, the nuclear weapons, is not anything that we ought to want to contemplate. What we can do is very, very difficult. But our problems with Pakistan go way, way back. You know, Pakistan was a close ally of the United States when it, when it was first became a state. Then after the second Indo-Pak war, we put an arms embargo on both India and Pakistan. And it didn't matter, the Indians had an arms industry. 
So it didn't matter much for them. Pakistan didn't. And I think it led them to believe they could no longer rely on the United States as an ally. So they started nuclear weapons development. As they started that development, we put more, our law required putting more and more sanctions on. So it pushed them in a way in the direction that, that they went. So it's been a, it's been a very complicated relationship. Uh, there's, there's a limited amount that we can do. No, we, we've asked, for example, the Pakistan army, since its organization, has faced India and, and is trained for the possibility of another conflict with India. Now we're asking that army to turn and face their western border, not India, to fight the kind of war they haven't been trained to fight, that is a guerrilla war, against their own people. And that's a real strain. And you can see that in the daily reports of, of us taking action and the Pakistanis supporting us or objecting. It's an extremely difficult situation. And we need to proceed with great caution because whether, whether we think this government is stable or not, uh, no government is certainly not the solution to it. Um, hi, Mr. Scrowcroft. Uh, my name is Diego. I'm a second year MPP student here. My question is uh, psychological, sort of psychological. Um, you often hear that uh, a, a polit politicians say uh, that America is the greatest country on earth. I think certainly it's a wonderful country, um, uh, probably one among many. What, what do you think that sentiment has on, on American foreign policy? What would affect? Well, uh, you know, we think we're the greatest country on earth. And uh, uh, let, me, let me put it in terms, of, in terms of foreign policy. There have really been three, three phases of American foreign policy that express this feeling. The first is, uh, uh, is George Washington, John Quincy Adams expressed it both. And that is that we conceived ourselves as a shining city on a hill, an example of man's ability to live in peace and harmony with his fellow man. Uh, but that was it. And we thought others looking at it, we would hope that they would emulate, but no farther. And uh, John Quincy Adams put it both in a famous statement he made that uh, we wish well to all those who seek freedom and independence, uh, but we go not in search of monsters to destroy. We're the well-wishers of all who seek freedom and democracy. We're the guarantors only of our own. And we had that notion, which is, yeah, we think we're the greatest country, but we're not trying to push it. Then comes Woodrow Wilson, and he says, that, that's insufficient. We need to be evangelizers of democracy. We need to spread it. And then with this administration, another step beyond that, we need to spread it by force if necessary. And I think that that, that latter adumbration of the idea is what has aroused so much hostility in the world. Uh, and as I say, we're the, we're the only ones who can galvanize the world. But we can't do it if we say, we're the indispensable power. We're the only ones who matter. We are the exceptional country. Given the time, what I suggest we do is each of the three people up ask short questions, and then we'll let Brent wrap up with the three. Please introduce yourself in, in the lows. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Thank you, General, for being here, and thank you for your lifetime of service. My name is Ryan Keith, and I'm an MPP-1 student here at the Kennedy School. 
Uh, I lead an NGO in uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia, and uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, rising influence of China in developing countries, particularly in Southern Africa. How should that, if, if any, impact uh, influence U.S. foreign policy in the region? Again, my name is Abdul, and I'm a doctor at Beth Israel Hospital, and I'm from Pakistan. Uh, I'll just give two examples. Uh, like, uh, America has been supporting a dictatorship in Pakistan for a long time, like first General Zia and then President Musharraf. And if you look at uh, other places in the world, like everywhere, South uh, America to Africa and everywhere, including Palestine, Hamas won the election, but then U.S. backed PLO rather than Hamas. As a result, the uh, region became much more unstable, right? So don't you think uh, that's a clear evidence of uh, US double standards uh, when it comes to uh, democracy? You truly are the biggest democracy, and uh, you want to impose democracy in other parts of the world as well. But uh, there is a clear contradiction between words and actions. A double standards on democracy, and mm -hmm. you get the last question, please. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Maimi Ueno. I'm a secondary student uh, here, and I'm from Japan. My question also pertains to the China, the rise of China. And uh, it seems like the uh, uh, United States is very much concerning the rise of China, not only for the mil uh, not only for the economic power, but also military uh, power. And and if the United States DOD pursues the SASO uh, support and stabilization doctrine, how would you achieve um, those goals which can come up with the um, the uh, you know the strategy to China? and as well as the, uh, the Sasso doctrine. I'm sorry, I, I'm not clear about my question, sorry. Uh, so the question is about China and strategy for China. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, there are two on... Uh, two on China. Two, two on China. Uh, I think if, if we've had a foreign policy, a continual foreign policy success anywhere, it's been China policy. Since Nixon went to China in 1972, every American president of either party uh, has come to follow the same general policy toward China. And some of them have come into office with dramatically different ideas about, about China. But they've all come back to the notion that a stronger, deeper relationship between our two is in the U.S. national interest. Now, uh, I think China is just is in a, in a process still of emerging. When the communists took over China, and for the first 20 years, until the Nixon visit, for example, China was an autarkic country, a hermit kingdom, in essence. Didn't, didn't really, was not interested in relations with anybody else, thought that they were there by themselves or developed themselves independently. Then came the Nixon visit, and they opened up a little. But we had a very narrow relationship. The relationship was built solely on a common hostility to Soviet hegemony. Uh, now, gradually, the Chinese have come out of, of, of that. And I mentioned briefly on, on Korea is one of the best examples. The Chinese now are actively supporting a policy in North Korea that is something other than just their narrow self-interest. Self even in Darfur, the Chin original Chinese attitude toward Darfur was, we buy oil from Sudan. What, they do, what they, else they do is not our business. Well, gradually now they're saying, yes, we will try to use our influence in Darfur. And so I think gradually they're coming to the notion that, that Bob Zellick, when he was Deputy Secretary of State, that China's becoming a responsible stakeholder. And I think 
that that's likely to continue. They are increasingly dependent on the outside world for raw materials, especially energy. And they're also dependent on the outside world for markets, for their products. What does that mean? That means they have a stake in the stability of the international system. So uh, do we think exactly like the Chinese? No, I don't. no, not at all. But I think there is no reason that this relationship cannot, uh, cannot prosper and deepen. About the Chinese uh, in, uh, in Africa especially, uh, yes, it, it's very interesting because they're moving in, they're promising projects for the Africans, they're developing trade relationships, but it's very interesting the construction projects and things that they offer the Africans. They bring their own labor and the Africans don't much like that. Uh, well, you know, they're going to learn, I think. And are they trying, what they're trying to do, in a way, is to assure themselves markets for their goods and raw materials for their country. But I think, you know, if we can continue to reach out to them, work with them, that uh, that that that's that's a phase I wouldn't worry. About. That's that one I'm less worried about because it's self-destructive in the long run. If they if they used African labor, I'd be more more concerned about what they might be up to. Is that and is that the end? Final one was on uh, double standards with respect oh, to democracy and oh, autocracy. Oh oh yeah, there's there's. Uh, there's no question about it, and, and the, the best example is Hamas, uh, absolutely. We, we, encouraged, we encouraged the Palestinians to have elections, uh, and when Hamas won, we said, uh-uh, uh, can't do that, can't do that. Uh, and that's, but that's part of the problem that we've, we've been in. We've been confused now about, about a lot of things, and uh, uh, and, and democracy is, is, is one of them. Uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the problems uh, that we have with Georgia, for example, is that we have seen the colored revolutions in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, in Georgia, places like that, as the triumph of democracy. Well. They're, they've held elections and uh, so on, but we, and, and we've used that as a, way, a weapon against the Russians. The Russians think what we're doing is trying to create enemies on their borders, and what we say the Russians are doing is recreate the Soviet Union. Uh, and what's happening in countries like Georgia and Ukraine is that they're trying to come to grips with themselves, who they are, uh, who they belong to, what kind of government they have. And one of the, one of the problems of that part, the Soviet Union divided up a lot of these ethnic groupings and, and Ukraine, they just gave the Crimea to Ukraine. Well, the Crimea has been Russian for 200 years, and, uh, but it didn't really matter. And while it was the Soviet Union, Russians moved out and settled in all these areas, and now they're independent and don't belong to Russia, and that's why Medvedev is partly saying, you know, these are all Russians, we have to protect them. So it's created a very complicated question. But you're absolutely right. You you either you either pursue democracy and abide by the results, or you don't you don't take that gamble. I what can I say? Uh, so on that note, uh, let me remind you uh, this book uh, <laughs> by. Uh, Brent and Spig Wyshynski. I'm not trying to sell thing. books. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I agree. I'm promoting the book. It'll, it'll continue an extraordinary conversation 
with an extraordinary American. So let's say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. I can listen to you to talk all night. Uh, there's some people that just probably going to shake your head.